Hello and welcome to another video in uh, this epic slog through a pluralistic universe by William James. We were in lecture five and I'm making one more effort to get through it. Lecture five. I've made efforts that have never seen the light of day because wow, lecture five is hard. I decided to eventually just type up a short summary of everything else in lecture five so that we could actually get through this. Let me actually look at two entertaining moments of lecture five to make um, a little clearer what my situation is. Here's a passage in lecture five where James says, I am dragging you into depths unsuitable, I fear, for a rapid lecture. Such difficulties as these have to be teased out with a needle, so to speak. And lectures, lecturers should only take bird's eye views, etc. Let me go to this remark near the end of lecture five. The particular intellectualist difficulty that had held my own thoughts so long in advice was, as we have seen at such tedious length, etc. So there are a couple of hints in the text that uh, when James was giving his lecture originally, he realized he was talking about some stuff that wasn't that easy to understand. He may have noticed his audience being bored or being confused or being tired. Lecture five is not easy. I'm going to give you uh, this, this here on the screen, this attempt to make some sense of lecture five. My suggestion, take this and use it as a model for understanding lecture five. Use it until you learn a better one. So we've introduced in the previous video, the first two pages of lecture five on the compounding of consciousness. Uh, let's see, uh, he's talking about the idea that states of consciousness, so-called, can separate and combine themselves freely and keep their own identity unchanged while forming parts of simultaneous fields of experience of wider scope. The idea that states of consciousness can overlap, separate, join together. That idea from first paragraph of lecture five, and he gave a great example that we should probably briefly review. Uh, if you pay attention to, say, well, I'll use me as an example. I'm sitting here talking about James, and initially I wasn't paying attention to how my left elbow feels. Now I'm paying attention to how my left elbow feels, and it was it was resting on this this um, this arm rest on the chair here, and. Uh, and I, I can feel the, the soft rubberiness of the, the armrest on this chair here. But I don't feel it really until I'm paying attention to it. At least it's not, it's not part of my conscious experience. But there is a sensation there. There's this physical sensation. It's a mental experience, but I'm not consciously aware of it. So that sensation of the, um, of the elbow on the on the chair arm is uh, a state of consciousness, a mental state, a state of consciousness that is apparently separate from my conscious self at that time. And then once I start paying attention to it, is combined with my conscious self. Um, states of consciousness separate and combine themselves freely and keep their own identity unchanged or forming parts of simultaneous fields of experience of wider scope. So this is following on Fechner in lecture four. Fechner. Gustav Theodor Fechner, one of the um, uh, one of the major figures in the backstory of this interesting little book by William James. Following on Fechner's ideas as described in lecture four, James is interested in the idea that states of consciousness maintain their distinct identity while combining to form other states. And of course, this is going to be his model for giving a pluralistic pantheistic rather than a pluralistic monistic account of reality. All is, all is divine, not all is one, a pluralistic universe, but also a pantheistic one, not a monistic pantheism. In other words, it's more empirical alternative to the Hegelian philosophy that was uh, very prominent in American and British universities in James Day. All right, so he's talking about this idea, and I gave an illustration uh, from my own life. You do for yourself. Pay attention to your left elbow 
your your right ear, your uh, right elbow, left ear, back of your neck. Pay attention to something you haven't been paying attention to for the last few minutes, and you might realize you've been feeling something there all along. I'm now looking, uh, paying attention now to my left leg and realizing it's slightly uncomfortable. So I, I adjust my legs, and now if I don't pay attention much, I'll have more sensations uh, from different parts of me, and I won't even know how I'm having them because different states of consciousness uh, maintain their identity, separate and combine themselves freely. James is looking into this idea. So now the rest of this uh, lecture five, he's going to look into the idea. I'm going to give you this super brief overview of it. James says, in the year 1980, I published a work on psychology in which it became my duty to discuss the value of a certain explanation of our higher mental states that had come into favor among the more biologically inclined psychologists. Suggested partly by the association of ideas and partly by the analogy of chemical compound, this opinion was that complex mental states are resultants of the self-compounding of simpler ones, etc. The lower forms of consciousness taken together are the higher. It taken apart consists of nothing and is nothing but them. This at least is the most obvious way of understanding the doctrine and is the way I understood it in the chapter in my psychology. So he's talking about his earlier book, The Principles of Psychology, and a theory he considered in that book. It's the theory that our minds are made up of smaller experiences. My consciousness is just the sum of its parts. A mind is reducible to a bunch of smaller mental experiences. This is the view that I hold is just its parts. Now, James has just described this view. It's a view he considers in his earlier book. So uh, part of the difficulty of lecture five is he talks about so many different opinions, and they're not all his. And they're not even all his at this time. Some of them are his at a different time. So there's this uh, tricky motion between different perspectives, some of which he accepted at previous times but does not accept now, some of which he was rejecting at previous times, so I don't think he ever goes back to accepting them. Um, it's, oh, and perspectives he's considering now, but also rejecting anyway. Uh, you, it's, it's hard to get, keep them all straight. I'm doing what I can <laughs> to keep it straight for you. Uh, the idea that our minds are just their parts, and that their parts are all our smaller mental experiences, the idea that a whole is its parts, is an idea he earlier considered in the principles of psychology, and refuted. Now, in place of it, uh, he said something else. He said, I think mental states are irreducible. They cannot be reduced to their parts. There is such a thing as an indivisible mental state. It includes lesser mental states, but it is not just the same thing as they are. My mind contains the parts of all my experiences. My mind contains the parts which are all of my experiences, but it's not just the same thing as all those parts added together. So now describing his earlier uh, criticism in his book, The Principles of Psychology, of this view, describing his earlier criticism, he says, do not talk, therefore, I said, of the higher states consisting of the simpler or being the same with them. Talk rather of their knowing the same things. Don't say that they're made of lower states. The higher mental states are not made of lower mental states. Rather, they know the same things. As far as I'm aware, the language I, I instinctively use, the higher mental states contain or include the lower ones, but are not reducible to them, is acceptable language for describing what James is describing. But his words are, don't say that the higher states consist of the simpler, or are constituted by the simpler. Don't say that the higher mental states are the same with them. Don't say that the higher mental states, uh, don't talk of the higher mental states being the same with the lower mental states. Talk rather than knowing the same things. A higher mental state, like the state of my mind now, knows the lesser mental states, like uh, how my elbow feels. There are different mental facts, but they apprehend each in its own peculiar way, the same objective A, B, and C, and D. The theory of combination, I was forced to conclude, is thus untenable being both logically nonsensical and practically unnecessary. Say what you will, 12 thoughts, each of a single word, are not the self-same mental thing as one thought of the whole sentence. Uh, the sentence I'm speaking now is made up of various words, and you can have a thought of each of the words, but your thought of the whole sentence is not just the sum of the thought of all the words. That's not how it works. 
the higher thoughts, I insisted, are psychic units, not compounds. Units, not compounds. There is such a thing as an indivisible mental state. It may include lesser mental states, or in Jamesian language, it knows the same things. But it's not just the same thing as they are. The higher thoughts I insisted are psychic units, not compounds, but for all that, they may know together as a collective multitude the very same objects, which under other conditions are known separately by as many simple thoughts. For many years, I held rigorously to this view, and the reasons for doing so seemed to me during all those years to apply also to the opinion that the absolute mind stands to our minds in the relation of a whole to its parts. So he's dealing with this theory in psychology, but it's closely related to the Hegelian philosophy that he's critiquing now, that he has critiqued earlier. He was explaining that the whole is not just its parts. There is a problem with the idea that parts equals the whole. And um, uh, the, hang on. There is a problem that the whole is just its parts. Let's, let's leave it at that for now. There was a problem that the whole was just its parts that he's explained. The problem with the idea that the whole is just its parts is it doesn't make sense. There are um, mental units, not compounds, mental states that may know the same things as smaller mental states, but cannot be explained merely as a collection of those smaller mental states. So now the Hegelian view is another version of the idea that parts equals whole. The Hegelian view is something like the reverse of the view he refuted in Principles of Psychology. But it is uh, the same kind of idea that parts equals whole, only in reverse. Instead of saying the whole uh, is just the parts, we say we say the parts are just the whole. I'm not sure that's phrased properly. Uh, the parts are just the whole. Each part is uh, identified with the whole and is what it is only because of the whole. I don't know how else to explain it. I'll just say that. The parts are just the whole, meaning that the parts are identified with the whole and they are what they are only because of the whole. That's the Hegelian view. Now, this Hegelian view does make some sense. Now, let's go back to the text. The great uh, metaphor for this perspective has always been, as I lately reminded you, a grammatical sentence. So uh, the sentence I'm using now has multiple words, and you can have an experience of hearing me say each of the words and an idea of what each of the words is, but your experience of me saying the whole sentence and your idea of what the whole sentence is cannot be explained by the parts alone. Uh, if suddenly the meaning of the whole sentence flashes, the sense of each word is taken up into that whole meaning. Just so, according to our transcendentalist teachers, the absolute mind thinks the whole sentence, while we, according to our rank as thinkers, think a clause, a word, a syllable, or a letter. Most of us are mere syllables in the mouth of Allah. And as Allah comes first in the order of being, so comes first the entire sentence, the logos that forms the eternal absolute thought. Uh, so the transcendentalists affirm the complete absolute thought is the precondition. No, so the transcendentalists affirm the complete absolute thought is the precondition of our thoughts, and we finite creatures are only insofar as it owns us as its verbal fragments. Okay, so he's describing, uh, well, honestly, I think he's describing the Hegelian view here. If not, it's a closely enough related view that I think uh, this will be no problem to say this. He's describing the Hegelian view, something very similar. Uh, according to which whole equals parts, parts equals whole, and specifically the parts define the whole with the uh, the earlier reductionist view. Oh, wait, with the earlier reductionist view, the parts define the whole. With the Hegelian view he's talking about now, or the reductionist view, parts define the whole. Sorry, there we go. The early reductionist view, he, the reductionist view he considered earlier in his book, The Principles of Psychology, 
whole equals parts, parts define the whole. Idea is considering now a more Hegelian view. Parts equals whole. Whole defines the parts, not vice versa. I'm going to say that again in case I botched it. The earlier view, considering the principle of psychology, the reductionist view, parts equals whole, and specifically, parts define whole. And the view he's considering now, the Hegelian view, parts equals whole, and whole defines the parts. The parts are what they are, only because of the whole. The metaphor is so beautiful and applies moreover so literally to such a multitude of the minor holes of experience that by merely hearing it, most of us are convinced it must apply universally. The Hegelian idea makes a lot of sense. It describes certain uh, common sense, uh, everyday observations on the world as we know it. We see that no smallest raindrop can come into being without a whole shower. No single feather without a whole bird, neck and crop, beak and tail coming into being simultaneously. So we unhesitatingly lay down the law that no part of anything can be except so far as the whole also is. This is the handle of a teacup right here. And without the whole teacup, there's no handle of a teacup. What this thing is, is the handle of a teacup, which means its entire identity, its entire nature, its entire essence is defined by the whole teacup. You can repeat that exercise for the other parts of the teacup, the base, the walls. So the Hegelian idea makes a certain amount of sense. Extending the analogy of certain holes, of which we have familiar experience, the whole of holes, we easily become absolute idealists. So we easily take on the Hegelian view, and we say that our minds are parts of the mind of God, and we are defined by God. Our minds that are part of God are defined by the whole. Our minds are parts of the mind of God. They are defined by the mind of God. Um, we don't think anything except because God thinks us, and what I am is a thing God thinks. But if, instead of yielding to the seductions of our metaphor, be it sentence, shower, or bird, we analyze more carefully the notion suggested by it, that we are constituent parts of the absolute's eternal field of consciousness, we find grave difficulties arising. So there are some problems with Hegelian idea as well. It makes a certain amount of sense. But he's going to criticize it now, much as he criticized the earlier reductionist view. Um, in Principles of Psychology, he criticized a reductionist view of mind where, not in contemporary philosophical terms, where mind is reduced to matter. No, we're just reducing mind to smaller mental states in this view. Anyway, he refuted that view in his earlier book. It was a version of parts equals whole. And he was refuting this particular version that says that whole is defined by parts. Now he's... Uh, about to critique the Hegelian view that says parts equals whole and parts are defined by whole. The Hegelian view makes some sense, but there are problems with it. He's giving us now three of the problems. I'm not going to systematically explain them, uh, but they're in the paragraphs beginning with, but if instead of yielding and it is impossible to reconcile and a third difficulty is this. So I will read some of these. First, the difficulty I found, never mind. Uh, first, if the absolute makes us by knowing us, how can we exist otherwise than as it knows us? So if God makes us by thinking us, if God makes us by knowing us, then we can't exist in any way except as God knows us. But God knows each of us indivisibly from everything else. This is not the Christian idea of God. This is not the Islamic idea of God. Uh, this is not Judaism here. He's talking about Hegelianism now. This is the Hegelian idea of God. But it knows us, each of us, indivisibly from everything else. So God, on the Hegelian picture, knows that I am not separate from my teacup. And you are not separate from me. And you are not separate from my teacup. You are the teacup. That art thou in the, in the, in the Hindu language, if I remember correctly. But it knows each of us indivisibly from everything else. So according to the Galian picture, you really are the teacup. I really am you. Yet if to exist means nothing but to be experienced, as idealism affirms, we surely exist otherwise. We experience ourselves ignorantly and indivisibly. So we're dealing with the Hegelian view, which is committed to the principle of idealism. Now, this does not mean idealism as opposed to pragmatism, which is some sort of... Uh, uh, description in political philosophy of, I don't know, how hard should we try to do everything right, or I don't know, something like that. That's not a very good description. doesn't matter. Off topic. Not idealism as opposed to uh, practicality in political science. Um, not the sense in which Nixon is a pragmatist 
And Karl Marx is an idealist because he wants to make a perfect world. Not that. Uh, we are talking about idealism and metaphysics, which is the theory that mind is real or strong versions of it. And actually, this will be the official definition of it, possibly in some sources. Idealism is the theory that all is mind, that everything that is, is thought, meaning the thinking or the thing thought. Uh, to be is to be perceived is the, the idealist principle. Uh, George Barclay, the idealist philosopher of the early modern era, says, essay est percipii, to be is to be perceived. And this is the, uh, the motto, guiding principle of idealist philosophy. So the Hegelian philosophy he's talking about is a form of idealism. So it says to be is to be perceived. So what is perceived is, what is perceived is real. And I perceive that I'm not the same thing as the teacup. I'm not the same thing as you. I don't even know who you are. You're not the same thing as the teacup. You've never met my teacup. In fact, I bet there's something behind my computer camera that um, you don't even know is there. So I don't think you think you are it. You experience the world as being different. Okay, let's pick something above it, not, not behind it. You don't think that you're the same thing as this nice box of jasmine tea. You don't think you're that. Uh, that's how you experience the world. So you really aren't that. What is perceived as real. And yet, according to Hegelian philosophy, you are that. That art thou. Um, God knows that all is one. So that's weird, uh, if not just blatantly contradictory and therefore ridiculous. So that was the first difficulty with the Hegelian view, although it does make some kind of sense. Uh, the second difficulty, it is impossible to reconcile the peculiarities of our experience with there being only the absolute mental object. Uh, objects. I don't think I'm going to uh, elaborate on that. A third difficulty is this. The bird metaphor is physical, where we say that a feather doesn't exist unless a bird exists. A feather is defined by the bird and not vice versa. The bird metaphor is physical, but on reflection, we see that in the physical world, there is no real compounding. Poles are not realities there. Parts are only realities. Physically speaking, only um, parts exist. Holes do not exist physically speaking. Uh, etc., etc. In the mental world, on the contrary, holes do, in point of fact, realize themselves as such. The meaning of the whole sentence is just as much a real experience as the feeling of each word is. Each word may have its own experience when you hear it, but the meaning of the sentence is itself a distinct thing from the experience of knowing each word of the sentence. So that's uh, his third difficulty with the Hegelian idea. So James gives three problems with Hegelian ideas. So again, we're talking about two different versions of the idea that whole equals parts and part, parts equals whole. James is now critiquing the Hegelian version of that idea. And he has for years rejected the Hegelian idea of the absolute mind for these kinds of reasons, reasons similar to his own rejection of that earlier theory about the mind he rejected in Principles of Psychology. Now, that's not the final story. That's not where he stops now. He doesn't stop and say, therefore, I refuted Hegelianist, and that's that. No, he's got to he's gotta do more work. He's got to try to figure things out. And he realizes these Hegelian philosophers are geniuses. They're on to something. If I had been lecturing on the absolute a very few years ago, I should, ha I should unhesitatingly have urged these difficulties and develop them at still greater length to show that the hypothesis of the absolute was not only non-coercive from the logical point of view, but self-contradictory as well. Its notion that parts and whole are only two names for the same thing, not bearing critical scrutiny. If you stick to purely physical terms like stars, there is no whole. If you call the whole mental, then the so-called whole, instead of being one fact for the parts, appears rather as the integral reaction on those parts of an independent higher witness, such as the theistic God is supposed to be. All right, so for years, he rejected the Hegelian idea for these reasons. Just a few years ago, if he'd been lecturing on the same topic, he'd be saying that and leaving it at that. But there is more. He says, after just a bit, he says, so much for the personal confession by which you have allowed me to introduce the subject. So all of this was just backstory. Uh, how many pages? One, two, three, four, five, uh, one, two, three, four, five, about six pages of backstory. All of this was just backstory to where we are now or where, where James' mind is now, what he's thinking now. 
And now he says, let's consider the matter more objectively. The fundamental difficulty I found is the number of contradictions which idealistic monists seem to disregard. Hegelian types who think all is reality, all is mind, all is one, all is God. They uh, ignore certain contradictions. In the first place, they attribute to all existence a mental or experiential character. But I find their simultaneous belief that the higher and the lower in the universe are entitatively, entitatively identical and compatible with this character. Now, that means at the level of an entity, they are identical. Entitat <laughs> entitatively, at the level of entity, they are the same entity, according to the Galian view. Okay, they attribute to all existence a mental or experiential character, saying... Uh, all is mind, all is mental, uh, to be is to be perceived. But they also say that the higher and the lower in the universe are the same thing. You are God, I am God, I am you, you are the teacup, the teacup is God, we are all the same reality. So that doesn't make sense. Uh, this is uh, the, just a, I think this is just a reiteration of that uh, first difficulty he already mentioned. Uh, so he still thinks this is a solid critique of Hegelianism. When I said it was backstory, it didn't mean he doesn't agree. I think he still agrees with his criticisms of these views. But it's not the whole story to give these criticisms in stock. There's more to figure out. The idealist in question ought then to do one of two things, but they do neither. They ought either to refute the notion that his mental states appear, so they are. They should give up on to be as to be perceived. Or, still keeping that notion, they ought to admit a distinct agent of unification to do the work of the all-knower, just as our respective souls or selves in popular philosophy do the work of partial knowers. Now, he's assuming here that um, uh, that they're going to stay Hegelian monists, people who say that uh, the parts equals the whole. Uh, so as long as they're going to say the parts equals the whole, there are only two things they can do. One, they can give up to be is to be perceived. Or two, they could... Um, Admit a distinct agent of unification to do the work of the all-knower. Uh, well, I suppose that means um, well, it means a position they won't take. I which I, I'm gonna, at the risk of making a quick mistake or oversimplifying, I think we can compare that to something more along the lines of traditional theism, traditional Christianity, Islam, Judaism. They could recognize uh, some sort of God. Uh, who is distinct from the universe. So I guess they wouldn't then be Hegelian monists when they, they'd be back to being dualists, uh, at least two realities. Okay, so um, those are their options, though. This is a short version of the trilemma James is setting up. Now, you may not know the word trilemma. Uh, trilemma means choice between three options, where dilemma means choice between two options. Uh, please don't be distracted by contemporary degenerate uses of the word dilemma to mean difficult situation. That's derived from the correct use of the word. Dilemma means choice between two options. So constructive dilemma, destructive dilemma, false dilemma, fallacy and logic are using the word correctly, assuming we use the word false dilemma, the term false dilemma, fallacy correctly, which we often don't, but you know, I've corrected that on this channel, or I will in a later video, depending on which video ends when, airs when. Pretty close, actually, I think. They'll be airing nearly the same time. Anyway, dilemma means choice between two options. Trilemma means choice between three options. So James is setting up a trilemma. Uh, let's first read this thing I have on the screen. Then we'll read a paragraph where he starts to set up the trilemma. James could not make sense of things. He's been years working on this. He thinks there must be some identity between parts and wholes. But that would make the whole universe crazy and irrational because mental parts, mental wholes, do not have the same characteristics. Now, you can worry about this at the level of just one person. Or you can worry about this at the level of everything. The level of everything, um, we can picture God as the, the whole of the universe, the mind that contains all knowledge, and parts and wholes have different characteristics because my experience of the world is not the same is God's experience of the world, or God's active knowing of the world, if experience is not the right word. Uh, and at the level of an individual soul, you could say, um, my 
I should say at the level of an individual person or self, you can say, my mind contains all my own experiences, but those experiences are not the same thing as my mind. They have different aspects, different characteristics. So the, the world doesn't make any sense uh, at a grand um, religious pantheistic picture of the whole. And the world doesn't make any sense, even at the level of just, just what I am, my own mind. It doesn't make any sense. Nothing makes any sense if parts are holes because of those differences between the parts and the holes. So, like, duh. And yet it seems like parts are holes. There must be some identity between parts and holes. That's what it means, right? For a thing to have parts. It is, well, that's what it means for a thing to be a whole. For a thing to be a whole is not to have components plus be something else. No, for a thing to be a whole is for it to be made of its parts entirely, to be just made of its parts. So, um, so that's weird. So we've got a problem. James can't make sense of things. Mental parts and holes don't have the same characteristics. And so that gives us the trilemma. I struggled with the problem for years, covering hundreds of sheets of paper and notes and memoranda and discussions with myself over the difficulty. How can many consciousnesses be at the same time one consciousness? How can one and the same identical fact experience itself so diversely? The struggle was vain. I found myself in an impasse. I saw that I must either forswear that psychology without a soul, which my whole psychological and Kantian education had committed me. I must, in short, bring back distinct spiritual agents to know the mental states, now singly, now in combination. In a word, bring back scholasticism and common sense, or else I must squarely confess the solution to the problem impossible, and then either give up my intellectualist logic, the logic of identity, and adopt some higher or lower form of rationality, or finally face the fact that life is logically irrational. Sincerely, this is the actual trilemma that confronts every one of us. Those of you who are scholastic minded, here he's talking to me, or simply common sense minded, still talking to me, will smile at the elaborate groans of my parturient mountain resulting in nothing but this mouse, except the spiritual agents, for heaven's sake, you will say, and leave off your ridiculous pedantry. Let but our souls combine our sensations by their intellectual faculties, and let but God replace the pantheistic world soul, and your wheels will go around again. You'll enjoy both life and logic together. This solution is obvious. And I know that many of you will adopt it. It is comfortable, and all our habits of speech support it. Yet it is not for idle or fantastical reasons that the notion of the substantial soul, so freely used by common men and the more popular philosophies, has fallen upon such evil days and has no prestige. In the eyes of critical thinkers, it only shares the fate of other unrepresentable substances and principles. They are, without exception, also barren, that to sincere inquirers they appear as little more than names masquerading Souls have worn out both themselves and their welcome. That is the plain truth, uh, etc. This being our post-Humean and post-Kantian state of mind, I will ask your permission to leave the soul wholly out of the present discussion to consider only the residual dilemma. Someday, indeed, souls may get their needs again in philosophy. I'm quite ready to admit that possibility. Uh, but if the belief that the soul ever, but if the belief in the soul in the soul ever does come to life after the many funeral discourses of which Humean and Kantian criticism preached over, I am sure it will only it will be only when someone has found in the term a pragmatic significance that has hitherto eluded observation. When that champion speaks, as he well may speak someday, it will be time to consider souls more seriously. Let us leave out the soul then and confront what I have just called the residual dilemma. Can we on the one hand give up the logic of identity? Can we on the other believe human experience to be fundamentally irrational? Oh my gosh, that was a lot of words. Okay. Okay, this is why I pre-typed observations on the text. Here's what I think he's talking about. James sees only three possible options. Admit that the universe is crazy and irrational because parts equals whole, but at the same time they're not equal. Or reject the idea that parts equals whole, which James refers to as the logic of identity. Or add some sort of soul to solve the problem. Some extra thing that puts the different bits of our mental lives together. That way the mind is not just a whole made of parts problem solved. This third option, which does solve the problem, could be applied on the level of the universe with the God on more of a traditional theistic model as separate from the universe, but knowing all that is known by the people in it. And frankly, this is my view. James will not take that third option. That's my view for soul and for God, assuming I'm understanding James correctly. <laughs> I think what he's describing, if I understand it correctly, is, is my own view. James will not take this view. The problem is that the soul in this way of thinking would be a totally unknown thing. An idea brought in to explain things, but which we have no comprehension of in itself at all. Also, there's just this influence of, well, 
people. Let's just say the universities of James Day. They made it hard for him to think uh, with all the Hume and Kant that's been thrown at him that uh, the idea of the soul makes any sense. But here's here's what I think is the basic problem with the idea of the soul that he thinks is is getting in the way of this option. The soul would, on this theory, be a totally unknown thing. We are assuming that it's there to explain other things, but in itself, we have no idea what it is. So if we can get a new idea of the soul that will explain what it is and thereby make it practical, then eh, this option will be live again. Now, I'm not going to sit here and try to explain what the soul is. This is way too off topic. Uh, let it suffice to say, however, that I don't worry about this. I, I think somewhere between... Um, Old Testament Hebrew conceptions of the soul, Aristotelian hylomorphism, and based on things I haven't read but know exist, like something uh, a book by my homeboy father, James Rooney, uh, Ch ancient Chinese philosophy conceptions as well pr probably work. Um, uh, hang on, I'm trying to think of other things. Oh yeah, Augustine, Aquinas, stuff like that. Actually, probably the New Testament as well. There probably is a way of understanding the soul, I think, that will avoid this problem. But... Uh, James doesn't have it in his head, and we're trying to understand James. Set it aside. Forget my view. I'm, I'm trying to explain James here as well as I can. Let me try to explain why he would say the soul is an unknown thing. Rather, let me not try to explain it, but let me suggest you do this if you want to know this better. James is thinking that the soul on this view is an idea brought in to explain things, which has no other mental purpose or function or use we don't know what the soul is. We just assume there's got to be a thing there to explain our mental experiences not being the same as their parts, but blah, 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 blah. If you go to James' philosophical forebears, I think you'll find a very good precursor to this criticism of the soul in Hume's critiques of the idea of the soul, in his writings, and in Barclay's critiques of the Lockean idea of substance. So John Locke, the philosopher, had an idea of substance. George Barclay, the philosopher, disagreed with Locke. He said that Locke's substance is an inconceivable somewhat. It's a thing that Locke assumes is there to explain other things, but he has no idea at all what it is in itself. That's pretty much, I think, more or less the same criticism as James has of the soul here. So he criticized the idea of the soul and sets it apart. And by the way, if you want to know about Barclay, I think I have at least two videos in this channel that should introduce it. Look for the, you know what, off the top of my head. Look for the cartoon. All right, so James' solution is to reject the logic of identity. Now, going back a bit, he says, logic must succumb to reality, not reality to logic. Let's use a different word since not all of us know the word succumb. Logic must submit to reality, not reality to logic. So there, James' solution is to reject the logic of identity. Now, I want to clarify, I don't think he's rejecting logic. The whole point of this option is to avoid the view of an irrational universe and to be true to experience, not a rejection of logic, it's rejection of what he calls the logic of identity, which is the rule that parts equals whole. The logical identity, the logic of identity actually, I think, is a version of the vicious intellectualism he was critiquing earlier. I believe that would be um, probably lecture one. He was critiquing vicious intellectualism. Towards the end then of lecture four, he will explain the... Uh, logic of identity as a version of the vicious intellectualism he was critiquing earlier, if I read him correctly. And he says, I prefer bluntly to call reality, if not irrational, then at least non-rational in its constitution. And by reality here, I mean reality where things happen, all temporal reality without exception. Meaning, uh, I think all he means is, well, we still do logic, we still don't contradict ourselves, but we no longer assume that parts must equal whole. And uh, particularly if that's how the world as we experience it seems to be. Now, one final observation, maybe I can shut up. In lecture four, uh, Fechner was a key character. Lecture five, he is drawing to some extent on Josiah Royce, at least in the first two pages. And at the end of lecture five, he says, hey, there's this other awesome guy who helps to explain things. And then he says, we'll talk about that guy in the next lecture. So I help to talk, hope, hope to talk about James talking about Bergson in the next video.
do me a tiny favor. If you've watched this whole thing, let me know in comments. I want to know who actually did this. <laughs> Woo. All right, one final, final, final remark. Again, this is me trying to make sense of lecture five. Do with it what seems useful. Um, if you don't know what to do with it, my advice is believe everything I say here. But bear in mind, it's a model for interpreting James. And be prepared to discard it if you ever encounter a better model for interpreting lecture five of a pluralistic universe.